John Michael Cooper is Professor of Music and holder of the Margaret Ruth Brown Chair in Fine Arts at Southwestern University in Georgetown, Texas. He is the author of books published by Routledge, Oxford University Press, the University of Rochester Press and Roman and Littlefield, as well as the editor of 12 editions of music by Felix Mendelssohn Bartholdy, published by Bärenreiter Urtext and other editions published elsewhere. He is the editor of an ongoing series of 64 editions of mostly previously unpublished works by Florence Price and of a series of more than 30 compositions by Margaret Bonds published by Hildegard Publishing Company in association with Theodore Presser. He is currently working on a monograph titled Margaret Bonds and the Poetics of Racial Justice, the Montgomery Variations and Credo in Context. Michael is no stranger to Ireland, having previously spoken at conferences and presented lectures at Maynooth University, Trinity College Dublin and the Royal Irish Academy of Music. We had hoped to see him again in person, but I'm very happy that he can be with us online today. And I would like to thank him most sincerely for accepting my invitation to present this lecture at what is for him a very early start of 8 a.m. in Texas. We look forward very much to welcoming you back to Ireland in the future, but for now, we are delighted to have Professor Cooper with us today to present this guest lecture entitled Black Feminism, Margaret Bonds and the Credo of W.E.B. Du Bois. Thank you, Professor Neary, for that very gracious introduction and the honor of speaking here today. It is still a little bit early here, so I'll be speaking help uh, speaking to you with the help of my coffee, which is also known as our sponsor. And it has fully been known as nine, it's fully it's been fully nine years since I last gave a lecture for the Royal Irish Academy of Music. In my own opinion, that's nine years too many, and I'm glad to be back, even though I'd rather be there in person, wouldn't we all? Um, before I start, a quick note about pronunciation. One would normally expect the name of the author of the text I'm about to be discussed to be pronounced Dubois, but he was from Philadelphia and pronounced his name Dubois, and so that's the pronunciation I'll use. More importantly, I'd like to share that we'll have some, we have some very special guests with us here today. These guests include members of the Georgetown University Concert Choir and their director, Professor Frederick Finkholder, who worked very hard under very challenging circumstances in order to pull together the audio examples that we will hear towards the end of this talk. Our guests also include soprano Katerina Burton, whose stunning rendition of Especially Do I Believe in the Negro Race, number two of the credo, we'll hear towards the end of this talk. And finally, we have with us today a nephew of Margaret Bonds herself, Mr. Orestes Richardson, the only person I know who can speak of the composer of the masterwork we're about to consider as Aunt Margaret. Welcome to you all and thank you for being here. Um, it's a frequent academic conceit to begin one's argument with two seemingly unrelated things and then try to tease out a substantive connection between them. And that is my plan for this talk. Please do note that I am aware of the irony of an old white guy sitting here discussing black feminism and that I speak here today with no arrogance, no presumption of authority, but rather simply as an ally, one whose chief aim is to stimulate awareness and appreciation of a major work that was written by a truly ingenious composer some 56 years ago, almost as long as that composer was alive and has only recently been published and only recently begun to enter the discourse about American music and 20th century music generally. I personally am convinced that this work is not only a musical masterpiece, but one that, if anything, is even more desperately needed today than it was when it was written. Um, and now to those terms that I promised you. The first of those terms is the first phrase of my title, Black Feminism which is also known, and let me adjust my uh, window here so that I can get this out of the way, which is also known sometimes as womanism. Although black feminism is sometimes portrayed as an outgrowth of white feminism or feminism 
in some more generic sense, that view is misleading because it construes black feminism as a pendant to a white counterpart, a view that I consider patently racist. In fact, black feminism is born not of white feminism or any other white phenomenon or experience. Rather, it is born of the condition of being both black and woman, a unique experience and condition. It dates from the 1830s, and it argues that racism, sexism, and classism are inseparable social constructs, which, because inseparable, must be fought inseparably and simultaneously. And it asserts, self-evidently, yet apparently provocatively, that the needs and perspectives of Black women differ profoundly from those of white women as well as Black men. My second and seemingly unrelated jumping off point is that in 1904, the great African-American sociologist, educator, novelist, and civil rights activist, William Edward Burkhart Du Bois, eventual founder of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, published the first version of his civil rights manifesto titled simply Credo. This civil rights creed was as brilliant and bold as it was eloquent. And in 1920, Du Bois reprinted it prefatory to his first autobiography, Darkwater. It became arguably the single most influential civil rights manifesto before Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s 1963 I Have a Dream speech. And it was printed on placards, displayed outside churches, recited by black school children, and even printed on small cards that could be carried in one's jacket or purse for ready reference. The connection between Black feminism, Du Bois, and his credo is a little odd because, to put it bluntly, the credo never mentions women at all, much less the particular needs and perspectives of Black women or how these differ from those of white women or Black men. It's true that Du Bois elsewhere uh, advocated strenuously for women's rights, Black women's rights, proclaiming that, quote, all womanhood is hampered today because the world on which it is emerging is a world that tries to worship both virgins and mothers, but in the end despises motherhood and despoils virgins, end quote. And that, quote, the uplift of women is next to the problem of the color line and the peace movement, our greatest modern cause, end quote. But Du Bois was, in the end, a male womanist, or in the eyes of some, even a masculinist, not a feminist. And as Selena Simpson notes in her critique of his late Black Flame trilogy, which was completed in 1961, quote, we should expect of a feminism that it not replicate the patriarchal structure of masculine, feminine, active, passive, public, private, nature, culture, that has been denied, or rather that has denied recognition to women's political action, voice, and work. We should expect of a feminism that it takes seriously women's capacities to be both Christ and Madonna, should they so choose." End quote. So this is the connection that I hope to tease out. In what follows, I assert that the connection between male womanist Du Bois and Black feminism as we now understand that term was none other than Margaret Bonds, specifically via her own outlook and the ways in which she applied that outlook in her setting of the Du Bois credo. The first step in this process is to understand Bonds' own thinking regarding Black feminism. And a crucial contribution to this understanding is made by an unpublished letter that she wrote to her husband, Larry Richardson, on December 17th, 1942. It was a difficult time for the couple. They had been married for just over two years and had agreed that he would continue working as a probation officer in New York City while she went for two months to Los Angeles on the opposite coast of the United States to work as a solo and duo pianist in the hopes that she would be able to find, to take advantage of the West Coast economic surge that had resulted from the outbreak of World War II and find a position that was sufficiently lucrative for them to bring him out to the West Coast to work with her. Those hopes did not pan out, but the situation produced a rich series of deeply personal and at times highly emotional letters that reveal much about the issues that Bonds and Richardson faced. The following letter, which I refer to, for reasons you'll quickly understand, as her destiny letter, is one such document, and it reveals much about Bonds' own perspective on her life, her work, 
and her situation as a black woman. Quoting, my mother believes in me. She loves me. She is willing to die with nothing so that I shall fulfill my destiny, uppercase D. Perhaps she too is an impractical dreamer. She endures and accepts for she sees, she knows, she knows that as there is the sun, I shall win. From my grandfather on down, my family all worked silently, quietly, in obscurity for mankind, for our oppressed race. They are not conventional people. They are individualists, thus their unhappiness and isolation. The bonds, they are considered fools. My grandmother, the child once removed from slavery, and my grandfather, the product of slaves and Indians, and my grandmother's father, an Irish immigrant, a man of courage who came over in steerage and made good, and my own father, who has great intellect and who would have been a great man had he not tried to conform to the taboos, inhibitions, and the rest of them. These are my blood, my soul. I cannot help myself this great desire to win. They all won before me, and I must go farther." End quote. The takeaways from this letter are many and complex. But for present purposes, I adduce it to show how Margaret Bonds's own musical mission, as she termed it elsewhere, was inextricably bound up with her general destiny, uppercase D, and how Bonds considered this destiny itself to be a sort of ancestral charge, one that placed upon her own shoulders a personal and professional imperative to use her music to address the right and right the societal ills that had forced her mother, her father, and her grandparents and great grandparents before her to work quote, silently, quietly, in obscurity for mankind, for our oppressed race, end quote. Another issue to be resolved here is that of chronology. Du Bois first published his Credo in 1904 and then republished it with revisions at the head of his first autobiography, Dark Water, in 1920. Margaret Bonds was just seven years old at that time. Du Bois died in 1963, and Bonds composed the piano vocal version of her setting of his Credo in 1965, orchestrating it then in 1966. The piano vocal version of the Credo was performed on March 12, 1967 in Washington, D.C., but Bonds never published it. The orchestral version was still unpublished and unperformed at her death in 1972 at the age of 59. It received a partial performance by the Los Angeles Philharmonic under the direction of Zubin Mehta on May 21st, 1972, and then it was performed in its entirety by the Compton Civic Symphony Orchestra and the Los Angeles Jubilee Singers under the direction of Hans Lampo on April 29th, 1973. Fast forward then some 30 years to 2003 when Rollo Dilworth, who is now Associate Professor of Choral Music Education and Chair of the Music Education Department at Temple University in Du Bois' own Philadelphia, prepared a new edition of the orchestral version as part of his DM dissertation. Most recently, the choral orchestral version and the piano vocal version have finally been published in my own edition in 2020 by Hildegard Publishing Company. The upshot of all this is that between them, the lives of W.E.B. Du Bois and Margaret Bonds span more than a century and overlap by a full half century. And the text and music I'll be discussing today span more than 60 years. That's a lot of time, so I need to talk fast and I need some more help from our sponsor. When Du Bois first published The Credo in 1904 at the age of 36, he was, in the words of one contemporary, quote, the best educated colored man, end quote, in the United States and a professor at Atlanta University. His youth, stature, and institutional affiliation were significant for all three generated professional tensions, which in turn played out in the credo itself. Atlanta University as a whole was what Du Bois privately would term the ivory tower of race, an institution that insisted even amidst the black codes and deep in the heart of the Jim Crow South, that African-Americans should be afforded a superior and well-rounded liberal arts education equal to what was accessible to whites. This contrasted starkly with the ideas of Booker T. Washington, who was some 12 years Du Bois' senior and founder of the Tuskegee Institute, some two hours away near Birmingham, Alabama. Washington and the Tuskegee Institute 
downplayed the evils of racism and taught that because African Americans had no generational history of societal enfranchisement with its attendant responsibilities, they needed first of all to acquire an industrial education in so-called useful trades in order to strengthen their economic position before earning full equality and advancing to the fullness of a liberal arts education such as what was available to Northern whites. For Washington and his supporters, black folk had to prove themselves worthy of membership in white society. The gradualness of the processes that Washington called for and its notion that African Americans needed to prove themselves to whites are repugnant to us today, certainly, as they were to Du Bois himself. And so Du Bois penned the credo a manifesto which opens with the salvo that God made of one blood all races that on earth do dwell, condemns war and colonialist exploitation and sacralizes in biblical terms the education of children, black even as white, as the birthright of a mighty nation. The importance of this credo is easy to understand. Modeled on a variety of sources ranging from the Apostles Creed and the 13 Articles of Faith of Maimonides to Zola's Jacuzzi, which had just been published one year earlier, it is a proclamation of inalienable human rights that the world color line systemically denied to black folk. And more importantly, a declaration that the writing of these injustices was divinely mandated. As shown in figure one, which we'll come back to several times, Du Bois constructs his creed as an arch, as the divinely mandated arc toward racial justice with the portrayal of justice as the cure for capitalist and colonialist oppression, serving as the keystone blue area here in the top portion of my figure. Du Bois is the top portion of the figure. Margaret Bonds is the bottom portion. This central area is an explanation of the themes that connect the two of them. The sanctity of this arch is underscored by the text's handling of the word God itself, for God is present exclusively in the first and last articles. Article one proclaims that I believe in God who made of one blood all races that on earth do dwell. I believe that all men, black and brown and white, are brothers, varying through time and opportunity in form and gift and feature, but differing in no essential particular and alike in soul and the possibility of infinite development. While Article 9 encourages us to trust and persevere in the quest whose objects have been traced in the interim, quoting, finally, I believe in patience, patience with the weakness of the weak and the strength of the strong, the prejudice of the ignorant and the ignorance of the blind, patience with the tardy triumph of joy and the mad chastening of sorrow, patience with God, end quote. These two articles are the credo's only mentions of God, but the remainder of the text reads as a compendium of the desiderata of social justice of its own day and ours. The first two internal boussoirs in this arch, the brown area here, are articles two and three, addressing themselves to both blacks and whites in a world that was intent on perpetuating a caste system that dehumanizes persons of color these articles introduce the arc toward racial justice by affirming in terms at once poetic and forceful, the inherent beauty, dignity, and humanity of blackness and the equality of all races in the eyes of God. Articles four through six, which collectively form the keystone of the arch, then assert the imperative for equality of persons of all races in relationships and work before condemning war, murder, and the wicked conquest of weaker and darker nations by nations whiter and stronger as the work of the devil and his angels, a mere foreshadowing of the death of that strength. Articles seven and eight, serving as boussois that mirror articles two and three, return to the affirmative spirit of article two, quoting, I believe in liberty for all men, the space to stretch their arms and their souls, the right to breathe, the right to breathe, and the right to vote, the freedom to choose their friends, enjoy the sunshine and ride on the railroads uncursed by color, celebrating the justice that will come when persons of all races are free and children of all races enjoy an equal education, thinking, dreaming, working as they will in the kingdom of beauty and love. 
And Article 9, the closing Springer, solicits patience. Not patience and waiting for whites to admit blacks into their own world that had been built through the work of the devil and his angels, but rather patience with God, patience in the knowledge that the arc toward racial justice is divinely mandated and, as it's put in Article 2, back at the beginning of this, shall yet inherit this turbulent earth. A transition by way of an aside, the right to breathe. Is there anyone here today in March 2021 who can hear Du Bois's proclamation of that inalienable human right and not be reminded of the grotesque murder of George Floyd, an unarmed black man by a uniformed white police officer sworn to protect and serve in Minneapolis, Minnesota on May 25th, 2020? Can any of us here today hear that phrase without being reminded of the eight minutes and 46 seconds on film that ended Mr. Floyd's life? a gruesome span of time that included the phrase, I can't breathe, along with the even more heartbreaking utterance, mama. And having been reminded of those things, can any of us here today doubt that Du Bois's words and Margaret Bonds's musical realization of them were addressed not only to their own world, but to ours, to us. This is but one of the elements of the credo that affirm in terms at once horrifying and eloquent and inspiring the enduring relevance of Du Bois's 1916 proclamation that the color line belts the world. Margaret Bonds obviously shared Du Bois's uh, vision, excuse me, that was a very emotional moment for me. Uh, Margaret Bonds obviously shared Du Bois's vision in ways that he would and likely would not have anticipated. Like Du Bois, Bonds suffered discrimination throughout her life and as an educated middle-class black woman who earned both bachelor's and master's degrees from Northwestern University near Chicago, considered it her destiny, uppercase D, to uplift and encourage other members of what she termed our oppressed race. But Bonds was a woman, one who is outspokenly critical of society's pervasive sexism. She was also insistent that gender equality, like racial equality, was an essential task that lay before the modern world. Her own statements in interviews and letters portray her as fourfold oppressed, as a black in a white world, as a woman in a man's world, as a black who composed in the predominantly white social sphere of classical music, and as a woman with talent. As she sardonically quoted or quipped in a Washington Post interview, quote, women are expected to do all the nasty things, and if a woman is cursed with talent too, then she keeps apologizing for it, end quote. Big issues, those, and we'll return to them presently. First, though, let me summarize how Bonds dealt with the considerable challenges of translating Du Bois's credo into musical terms. Most basic among these is the fact that Du Bois's credo is prose, not poetry. Because of its lack of regular meters, rhyme, and cadence, prose is difficult to set to music that is predicated, as Bonds's is, on the cadentially articulated metrically periodic phrase. Comparably basic is the sheer quantity of words in this text, simply because it takes longer to sing words than it does to speak them or read them. And the text of Du Bois's credo runs to 505 words, for comparison, that's 46% longer than the text of Sebastian Bach's Cantata 140, which runs to about 26 minutes in brisk tempo. The length of the text alone might have threatened to make Bonds' setting of it impracticably long. Margaret Bonds addressed the first of these problems, that of the metric, by generally maintaining periodic phrases in the accompaniment, but allowing the vocal parts to move in freer rhythms. More generally, she kept textual repetition to a minimum and combined some of the thematically related articles of Du Bois's text into single movements. Here we are with our friend figure one again. And as shown here, articles three and four of Du Bois's text are combined into a single movement as are article seven and eight. These combinations also enabled Bonds to replicate Du Bois's arch-like structure largely by means of her own credos, tonal structure, and scoring. Again, referring to our friend, figure one, 
The elements of Bonds's art are distributed somewhat differently than those of Du Bois's, but the parallel design is unmistakable. The key, mode, and scoring of the outermost movements reveal those movements to be springers, just as they are in Du Bois's text. The curve of the arc toward racial justice, launched by the first internal boussois, is especially do I believe in the Negro race. And numbers three, four, and five collectively serve as the keystone, here given also in blue, condemning war and capitalist exploitation. Justice, Bonds teaches through her music, just as Du Bois had taught this in his words, is the cure for exploitation and oppression. Number six, serving as the telos or goal of the directional arc toward racial justice, is a lengthy movement for solo baritone with chorus. And then with this arc completed, Bonds returns to a movement for full chorus in A minor, musically soliciting us not to waver in our trust that the weakness of the weak and the strength of the strong, the prejudice of the ignorant and the ignorance of the blind are but moments within this arc toward racial justice an arc that is mandated by God himself. One further point about Bonds's setting. It is tightly unified via the dactylic motive consistently presented in connection with the textual motif, I believe. See example one, and it's in the boxes here. This figure occurs in its original form, in augmentation and diminution, in all movements, in voices, and in instruments. Because of its close initial association with the textual mantra, I believe, this dactylic motive acquires a function not unlike that of a light motif, telling us in voices and instruments all the way through that we are to think, I believe, even when those are not the words that are being uttered. For purposes of this short talk, two excerpts will have to suffice to illustrate the arch-like structure of Bonds's setting of Du Bois's text. These are the crucial first and last movements. As mentioned earlier, in Du Bois's text, the meaning or significance of the last movement with its appeal for patience with God depends on our understanding that patience is not the supplication and waiting for white society's approval that were central to the ideas of Booker T. Washington, but rather perseverance in the knowledge that the quest for racial justice is one that emanates not from other humans, least of all white society, but rather from God himself. This is what makes the last article of Du Bois's text both a logical continuation and the fulfillment of the first. And Margaret Bonds's music makes clear that she construed these two articles in precisely this fashion. The first and last movements are both in A minor and use essentially the same thematic material, except that while number one fades out without a definitive conclusion, number seven, article nine, begins as an almost literal quotation, but then gains in energy and intensity. The reason for this is that Bonds musically drives towards, quote, the tardy triumph of joy and the mad chastening of sorrow, creating a powerful climax out of these words, both tragic and redemptive. Moreover, the last movement quotes from and alludes to the intervening five movements so that that last movement is not just the completion of the cycle that had been begun with number one, but even more importantly, a summation of all that has come before. Let me, okay. Let's listen now to the first and last movements of Margaret Bonds's setting of the uh, credo, and here you will hear the arch-like form that she creates out of Du Bois's arch-like words. First, number one.
inconclusive conclusion, which leads us into the rest of the arch and then to this final movement. movements beautifully translate, thank you, uh, beautifully translate Du Bois' affirmation of the divinely ordained mandate for racial justice into music. But you'll recall that I've also promised to explain the credo from a Black feminist perspective. If, as seems obvious, the centrality of the condition of being both Black and woman to Bonds' own outlook inevitably transferred itself into her own musical creed, then how did she reconcile the contradictions between Du Bois's male womanist or masculinist outlook with her own? I believe that Bonds' setting delivers on this perspective in two ways, one of which Du Bois might have foreseen, the other probably not. The first of these, and let me share this again, Which probably the first of these, which probably would not surprise Du Bois, concerns Bonds's handling of Articles Seven and Eight of the text, beginning with "I believe in liberty for all men" and "I believe in the training of children black even as white," respectively. The latter theme is certainly consistent with the lifelong masculinist facets of Du Bois's efforts in support of the uplift of women, but it also resonates with Bonds's own black feminist outlook. It's absent, of course, from her 1942 destiny letter because her daughter, Dionne Richardson, would not be born until 1946, some four years later. But by the time Bonds penned her credo in 1965 to 67, she had been a mother for nearly 20 years. By that point, the education of children, black, even as white, was thus something that by tradition and within her own life was a part of her identity as black woman. And so it's telling, I think, that uh, the movement of her credo that focuses on the training of children, black even as white, is the longest movement of the entire work by about a third, and the textual and musical goal of the arc of divinely mandated racial justice. What's more, this movement, the last internal boussois in Margaret Bonds's credo, and some of the most radiantly gorgeous music in the entire work, is in D major, which makes it the resolution of the structural dominant that launched the credo's arc toward a future racial justice that had been launched back in number two. This is a musical emphasis that was created not by Du Bois, but by Bonds, a black woman fiercely proud of her maternal heritage. Number six of Bonds's credo gives eloquent and unique voice 
to her perspective on the condition of being both black and woman, a central element of the definition of black feminism. But there's also another, and in my estimation, more compelling and beautiful way in which Bonds makes Du Bois's male womanist creed into one that is genuinely womanist and consistent with the ideas and aspirations of the second wave feminism of the mid 1960s when the work was written. This is the second movement, especially do I believe in the Negro race. A few general notes on this movement. First, just as the first internal bourgeois sets the curve of an arc, directing it towards the keystone and thence to the other end of the arc, in number two of Margaret Bonds's creed, she affirms the beauty of the genius of the Negro race, the sweetness of its soul and its strength in that meekness which shall yet inherit this turbulent earth. Second, the melodic and harmonic vocabulary of number two in Margaret Bonds's credo is evocative of black vernacular repertoires. It's in the Mixolydian mode and its melodic vocabulary is characterized by gapped scales with particular emphasis on the fifth and sixth scale degrees both characteristics of vernacular repertoires and in the context of a text that affirms the Negro race, specifically evocative of Bonds's ancestral heritage. Third, even though number two is a solo vocal movement in the context of a larger work that is sometimes described as a cantata, to designate this movement as an aria by genre would be wrong. It's not an aria. It is rather a kind of gospel song what Bonds's longtime friend and collaborator Langston Hughes described as an offshoot of the spiritual that was, quote, perhaps the last refuge of uncontaminated Negro folk music, end quote. And fourth, the form and structure of number two are determined by the principle of call and response, a central element of African-American music and indeed of the worship experience in African-American churches. A solo voice, here the solo soprano, leads and then has its ideas taken up by the group or congregation or choir with the soloist punctuating important ideas and phrases without interrupting the flow of the choir's declamation. The whole is modeled on the way a gospel song might be sung in an African-American church, an intimately communal experience affirming blackness that would have been unfamiliar to most of the work's presumable audience members. And I'll come back to that point a little bit later. And how does Bonds translate this non-gender specific blackness into a musical reflection on the condition of black womanhood? Quite simply, in Du Bois's credo, article two is the only article that begins with the word especially, and in Bonds's credo, number two is the only movement for solo soprano. These words set the divinely mandated arc toward racial justice into motion and set its curve. Du Bois almost certainly would envision, have envisioned those words as being in a man's voice, but Bonds did not. Instead, she entrusted that crucial role to a woman. It is black feminism in action, for in the quest for racial justice in Margaret Bonds's musical imagination, black woman leads. Let's now listen to this movement performed by soprano Katerina Burton with the Concert Choir of Georgetown University in Washington, D.C., conducted by Frederick Binkholder. Especially do I be 
Du Bois was a master of conclusions and so was Margaret Bonds. I am not. And this leaves me wondering how best to conclude these remarks in a fashion that will do justice to their subject. I concluded that's impossible. I can't conclude. I can't do justice to this subject. So rather than concluding, I'd like to do two things. First, I want to submit two questions which I hope will occasion further reflection from you, dear listener, on the nature and significance of Margaret Bonds's credo. And then I'll offer a closing thought, just a brief one. The first question, although we know that Du Bois was educated in music and appreciated the musical gifts of his eventual second wife, Shirley Graham, whose 1932 opera Tom Tom stands as one of the earliest operas written by an African-American woman, he never commented on music that was comparable to Margaret Bond's setting of his text, and he and Bond's never met. We have to wonder then, what would he and Bonds, what would he have thought of Bonds' setting of his credo, of its musical treatment of the arch of his text, its combining of several elements into single movements, and most importantly, its interpretation of the role of women? And a second question, what are we today to make of Bonds' strategy in setting this particular text, given the presumptive orchestra and audience demographics in the late 1960s in the United States? After all, the credo was written at a time with less than 5%, when less than 5% of United States professional orchestras contained any black players. The same was true of professional choruses and a similar situation obtained for audiences. Audiences were mostly white for orchestral concerts. The question then becomes, when Margaret Bonds, a black woman, composed a 23 minute classical musical celebration of the divine imperative for racial justice and gender justice to be performed by predominantly white male orchestras for predominantly white audiences. Was she in effect enlisting white men, many of them not necessarily sympathetic to the cause of racial justice and gender justice in a musical proclamation of that divine imperative? Was she using the beauty, the strength, and the sheer genius of her music to win listeners' hearts and minds over to the cause of racial justice and gender justice? Those questions will have to await future discussion. But hang on just one second, let me show you. You need to see the composer of this music. There is Margaret Bonds. Now, those questions will have to await future discussion. For now, let me close by just submitting this, that Margaret Bonds's imaginative interpretation of the Du Bois credo is an artistically extraordinary and voicing, not only of Du Bois's own ideas, but also of a black feminist perspective on those ideas. It's a 23 minute musical civil rights manifesto and a visionary masterpiece of unflagging inspiration. And it is a musical social justice manifesto, the likes of which the world had never seen before and has never seen since. With that, my friends, I thank you. Please be well and stay safe because you are important. Thank you for being here. <laughs>